Well, because they're doing audio. Oh. Sorry. Is this on? Okay, so we can go to the next slide, Deb. Okay, so a long time ago in an academic center far, far away, rogue faculty members roamed the hall. And our first faculty member is Dr. Voldemort, AKA, he who must be named. They're stress balls. <laughs> So fatal flaws include billed patients seen by his peers as new patients, failed to document time and counseling when billing by time, billed consults for a patient who was self-referred, and billed 99205 for all patients when medical decision-making did not meet that high level. If we move to the next slide. So a new patient is a patient that hasn't been seen by you or someone in your specialty for the last three years. I think a common scenario is that one of your peers may see a patient in the hospital setting and then they come to see you for a follow-up visit in the office. That would still be considered an established patient, not a new patient. Um, there, are, there is an alternate way to code your level of service. I think everyone received an E&M card in their packet this morning. Um, it's an outpatient card. Um, and if you wish to code your E&M service based on time, over 50% of the visit needs to be devoted to counseling and coordination of care. There are associated times located in the blue column next to the CPT code. For instance, 99214 requires 25 minutes. So if you wanted to build that service based on counseling and coordination of care, you would document the total time you spent with the patient, 25 minutes, and perhaps 15 minutes was spent counseling the patient, you would include those details. On the flip side of this card, you have a, the consult services and the new patient visits. Those require three of the three key components, history, exam, and medical decision-making. If you wish to bill a consult service, 99241 through 45, you need to ensure that you have the requesting provider's name in your medical record, and you send that report back to that requesting provider. It's not necessary to do so in the inpatient setting since it's a shared record in EPIC. As long as the documentation includes consult requested by so and so for such and such reason. When we wanted to quickly take a look at medical decision making, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Whoever. Rec yes. Correct. Well, you can also take over their care too. 
so they've sent them they've sent the patient to you for your advice and opinion and in your recommendations you want to continue to treat this patient you're sending the consult report back to that referring physician and you're you're taking over the management of the care you can still bill that as a consult it's different than if i'm in the community and i have a problem and i come to you directly say i want you to, to give me an opinion my doctor isn't sending me i'm coming i would be a, a new patient to you Yes, new patient, right? If they're kind of wiping their hands of the patient and saying, here, you take care of this problem, that's a new patient. Yeah. As a physician, I think that's probably difficult for you sometimes because of the information you're provided. You get a patient's chart when they come in, right? And, and you're not quite sure. Um, right. So, you, yeah, right, whether a physician has referred the patient or I came in on my own, you're still going to send a letter back to whoever I see. The billing, the billing is different, right. That is, that is um, problematic. I'm not sure if there's anybody in your department that um, is involved in the process that could help here. I mean, one would hope that a patient would say when they present that, you know, I see so-and-so in the community, but I really wanted a second opinion from you. Um, but that's another way it sounds like. There are department workflows that I'm aware of. I don't know of one specific for urology, but departments do have a workflow where the phone call comes in and they're there to document that in the scheduling component. So perhaps that's helpful. Okay, let's go on to the... The 99205 that Dr. Voldemort was billing all the time. Correct. So again, to bill a 99205, if you're not coding the service based on time, if you take a look at your E&M card, a 99205 requires a comprehensive history, a comprehensive exam, and high medical decision making. As opposed to a 99215, which is an established patient, you're required to hit two out of the three key components, which is a comprehensive history, comprehensive exam, and high medical decision making. So the point being, for a new patient or a consult, you need to hit all three key components. Um, given the EMR's ability to capture the history and the exam components, a lot of the focus from a carrier perspective and insurer perspective is the medical decision making. So we're going to walk through that process. For a level five, you're required to have comprehensive high medical decision making. Uh, medical decision making is broken down into three components. First, how many diagnoses or problems am I dealing with? Are they getting better? Are they new to me? The second is how much data am I reviewing? And the third is overall risk. And we'll break it down. And you actually have the form in your handout that breaks it down in a similar fashion. The first category is how many diagnoses. So if you're seeing a patient for the first time, um, you will get the most credit that you can obtain in this category, which is four points, a new problem with additional workup. Um, so that would give you four there, thank you. And if we move, and that would, that would equate to high in that category, but again, we have three categories and you need to achieve two out of those three categories for the level selected. The next category is how much data am I reviewing? So I'm not sure how much data you do review for a typical patient, but the first bullet is blood work. So if you look at one blood test or multiple blood tests, you get one point. The second one is radiology scans. It doesn't matter how many radiology scans you're looking at, you get one point. Then we have a medicine test. But I do like to point out that any direct visualization or independent review would heighten your medical decision making with this component with two points. If you decide that you're going to obtain a history from outside of the EPIC system or, or outside of the patient, that would give you additional points. Um, and if you're receiving an additional history from a family member or a caretaker. So that would heighten your medical decision making in that category. But for these purposes, we'll check off one lab and one radiology, which would give you low in this category. And we'll move on to the third category, which is the actual risk to the patient. Um, and you can select the level of risk based on any of those three categories. And if you move on to the next slide, I think we have a risk table there. So if you take note, under moderate for presenting problems, an undiagnosed new problem is identified there. So perhaps that's the case for your new patient. 
they would fall under moderate risk in this category. I just want to point out prescription drug management also falls under moderate risk under management options. Surgery with some acute risk factors um, would fall under high in the last column. And an individual with a chronic illness with severe exacerbation, likely going to be hospitalized, would fall under high risk there. So for cases of this new patient that you're seeing, we have four <clears throat> under the first category A, which gives us a high. We've looked at two points of data, which gives us a low under the second category. And our medical risk was moderate. So therefore, we would use the one in the middle, which is moderate medical decision making. So that's just an example of what that looks like. I don't, I don't believe that you're going to remember this point system. This is really an audit point system, but really just the premise on how someone would look at your medical record from a medical decision making perspective. I think the simple premise is if you've got somebody presenting to you that's not getting any worse, uh, they're, they're stable, kind of holding their own. Typically, your medical decision making is going to be less versus somebody coming into you that's getting worse or has an undiagnosed new problem that you've got to, got to really do some work up on. That would equate to a higher level versus your patient who's stable. So our second villain is Dr. Norman Bates, and the credentials are Hitchcock University. <laughs> So Dr. Norman Bates' fatal flaws included attested to advanced practice provider notes, failed to indicate medical necessity of MD participation in an APP visit, and utilized non-leased or employed Yale Medicine APP notes. So basically, we're addressing shared visit rules in this slide. So if, if you wish to work with an advanced practice provider and render an E&M collaborative services, there's a few criteria that need to be met. First, it needs to be medically necessary to have you participate in the visit. And in addition to that medical necessity, that needs to be documented. There needs to be a substantial component of the e &M that's performed by you as the MD. Um, in those cases, if, if that criteria is met, you can combine the documentation of the APP and the MD and bill at whatever level, generally a higher level, under the MD. Um, again, the APP must be a Yale Medicine employee which means they must be employed at least and credentialed by Yale Medicine. If you're not clear on that and you're working with an advanced practice provider, you really need to reach out to someone in your department to verify that. I think for the most part, the majority of APPs from the hospital have been leased over to Yale Medicine recently. And PAs must have a delegation agreement that's updated annually, which they're aware of that's part of their credentialing process. I'm not sure if anyone here is utilizing shared visits when they render E&M services. Do you have APRNs and PAs in the practice? We do. So the biggest thing <laughs> I see uh, when I look at documentation is that physicians tend to document as they would with a resident, all right? So you're going to put your two physician, I've seen, evaluated the patient, and you personalize that to the plan. That does not work with an APRN or a PA because they are billing providers in their own right, and the insurance company would much rather pay them at the 85 to 90% rate than the 100% in the physician fee schedule. So you're both independent billing practitioners. You need to document exactly what you've done for the visit. And attestation doesn't work. So if the APRN perhaps listens to the heart, um, here's something he doesn't quite like, and you repeat that exam of the heart, then you need to document what you've done. I know it's not inherent in how you, you, know, you, you kind of work clinically the same with everyone, but unfortunately with APRNs or PAs, you're two independent practitioners, and you each need to document what you've done. Uh, Kevin's in the corner. Perfect. All right, our next villain is Dr. Darth Vader. <laughs> confused. No, it's very different to <laughs> sci-fi fans. So Dark, Dr. Dark Vader's fatal flaws include no original documentation, cloned, copied, pasted all records of service, 
cloning errors continue to be promulgated. Um, so just to touch base on a few practices that are out there, Yale Medicine practice standards indicate that the copy forward, the copy paste feature cannot be utilized for a history of present illness, exam, and medical decision making. And these were practice standards that were um, published by Dr. Denver as part of the Yale Medicine protocols. Um, if you do forward documentation from a previous visit, you want to make sure that you update that documentation based on the visit at hand. Um, you want to update any exam components, any history components, based on what the patient is telling you that day. Again, due to the copy and paste functionality, um, medical decision making is really the main, main course for selecting your level of service. Um, in the ambulatory setting, there is a functionality called Make Me the Author. Um, which is really a misnomer. That was developed by Epic initially to help residents and fellows forward their documentation to a teaching physician. Um, there is a clear audit trail that's maintained in Epic. You cannot make yourself the author of anyone's documentation. You can clearly see every iteration of that note um, within Epic through the hover feature, through the previous version feature. So when an auditor is sitting with us um, at a computer, they can see that there's been multiple contributors to that note. Um, so just, I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. I think that Make Me the Author is really very misleading and led to a lot of problems when Epic was first implemented. Um, so I think the key piece here is that you don't want to bring any documentation forward that doesn't belong to you. You should be the initial author of that documentation if you wish to edit that documentation for the visit at hand. We see a lot of that, a lot of sharing of notes between an advanced practice provider and an MD. You want to make sure you're the original author on whatever you're bringing forward. Does someone from Dr. King Herod's fatal flaws include? I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. One more, one more. There you go. One more back. You do. But we're, yeah, so we're talking about scribes in this slide. And basically, um, scribe policy, there are, actually have two major projects that have been launched um, for scribe services. And what's required of the provider that's rendering the service is that you need to ensure that you attest that the scribe's documentation is accurate and sign that documentation. And within that attestation, it must be clear that you saw the patient. This is not something that the scribe can document for you. You as the billable provider need to insert that attestation. Um, we've sent out multiple um, emails, multiple educational blast regarding this, and we've worked closely with the scribe, there we go, we've worked closely with the scribe contractor. So that is a requirement that the physician or the provider that's rendering the service must meet. You must document your own attestation indicating that the documentation is accurate and that you saw the patient. The scribe has their own requirements. They must document that they've scribed for which provider and sign the note as well. Um, what we're finding upon review um, of a few records, not just in neurology, but throughout the university, is that the scribe is inserting that statement. So again, um, utilizing failure to document verification of a scribe's work um, and failure to document your presence, you need to make sure that you insert that smart phrase and personalize it. Um, what we like to remind folks of is in the hospital setting, and that's the majority of our work is done in the outpatient or the inpatient hospital setting, you cannot utilize an RN, a resident, or a fellow since they participate in the care. The current commission prohibits the use of um, providers that participate in the care as scribes. Um, and I think we went through all of this earlier. You must affirm that you have personally performed the service. You must document that you reviewed it for accuracy, and you as the MD must sign the note. You may have mentioned this, but I know that there's a virtual scribe project going on, and you need to be the one putting in your application. And this is a sample practitioner attestation that you're required to insert. The scribe cannot insert this attestation for you. So 
Dr. Corella DeVille's fatal flaws, including applying general attestations to resident E&M notes, merely co-signing a procedure and diagnostic test reports, and didn't verify resident or medical student documentation. So generally, this is an overview of teaching position guidance when working with a resident and a fellow. Um, basically, if you're working with a resident or fellow and you're providing an E&M service, you're required to document that you saw the patient, you evaluated the patient, and what your participation was in the plan. Your personalization should be around that plan component. Generic attestations that simply state that without any personalization are not acceptable or billable. For procedures that take less than five minutes and you generally have a zero to 10 day global, you need to document that you were there for the entire procedure if you wish to bill for a service that was rendered by a resident or a fellow. For a procedure that takes greater than five minutes, and those are usually the 90 day globals, if you wish to bill for that service that was performed by a resident or a fellow, you need to document the key components and your presence during the key components. Um, diagnostic tests, you need to re review and agree or make edits to the resident's interpretation and sign that note in order to bill for that service. That's one case where you can actually use a generic attestation if yes. a diagnostic test. So we didn't put any uh, additional information on here about medical students, but most of you may have heard that uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services came out with um, a bulletin that said that teaching physicians can now use medical student documentation. In the past, the only thing you were able to use from a medical student would be the review assistance and past family social history. So, you know, the balloons went up in the air, everybody's all excited about this change. And uh, in compliance, we had come up with a couple of smart phrases for you to use. And then as we discussed this further with the um, Association of American Medical Colleges, uh, there's groundwork that needs to be done before we can just flip the switch and implement this. All right, so for example, we need to figure out who needs to be involved in this process. Does the, does the hospital have policies that allow the medical student to document in the medical record? Um, they, they don't, uh, they have to uh, amend their policy. We need to check with Epic. What kind of access do our medical students have? Do they have the ability to forward a note to you? Um, you know, are you going to let any medical student document a history and exam and a plan in the medical record, or do you just want to confine that to third or fourth year medical students, which is something that, that you all need to consider. Um, have the medical students been taught to write good notes? And then for us, how, how do we get the information out to you as teaching physicians? How do we educate residents? And it's important for us to do that because in order for you to use a medical student's note, either the resident has to be physically present with the medical student or you need to be physically present with a medical student. And you need to either um, perform or re-perform the exam. So there's a lot of questions that we have uh, about this. The AAMC, we've submitted uh, our questions to them and they are approaching CMS about it and we're expecting an answer back from them, hopefully sooner than later. So you will be hearing more information from us about that. Uh, Dr. Capel, who's our medical director for compliance and I are coming up with an email to send out to all of you to, to sort of fill in where, where we're at with that. So I would kind of discourage you from changing practices at this point until we have some further information that really solidifies how we can put this change into effect. All right. Just a reminder that teaching physician guidance only applies to physicians. It does not apply to advanced practice providers. You couldn't utilize an advanced practice provider, a resident, an APP could not utilize a resident's note and treat it as a teaching position, and utilize a teaching position attestation. All right, our sixth villain out of our nine villains is Dr. Freddy Krueger. Uh, his communities are, he went to Elm Street University. And he built modifier 25, bill for a visit in addition to a procedure when the doctor paid the money supported the procedure. Losing our music. Uh, there it goes. You can still. I can still use one. <laughs> so, does anyone know where Freddy Krueger came from in the movie? Somebody said up. Nightmare on Elm Street. You got it. Right. Right here. Okay. So, Freddy Krueger's fatal flaws are he allowed an APPRN to use his ID and password. Uh, he built mm -hmm. modifier for an EM in addition to a procedure. So NetIDs and passwords should never be shared. 
Now, this is something I, I'm getting complaints about um, in the compliance department, which is uh, kind of a new trend. Part of it has to do with the Medicaid guidelines that require when you're working with a PA or HRN that you, the physician, have to document why it's medically necessary for you to get involved, why couldn't the HRN or PA handle it. I've had uh, several cases reported where physicians have logged in under their ID and password and let the PA do the documentation or HRN. These folks are not scribes. Uh, they are medical practitioners. You should never share your ID or password. I um, had another case where a physician gave their ID and password to um, an RN to answer their in-basket messages. Again, complete violation of the law and of our policies here at Yale Medicine. Uh, these resulted in written warnings to the practitioners, and our policy says do not give out your password to anyone, including IT staff or your supervisor. Don't share your account with anyone or let anyone use your account. And then misuse of this uh, will be regarded with the utmost seriousness. Alleged violations will be pursued um, and can lead up to sanctions, up to and including dismissal or expulsion uh, will be imposed. So th this is serious. Um, you also have malpractice for you if you're letting folks do that. Yep. That's a great question, and it leads right into what I'm going to talk about. My example was a patient is coming back for a scheduled urodynamic test, and the patient billed for the test and a visit, right? But when we looked at the documentation, there wasn't significant, separately identifiable information to support the visit. The documentation all supported um, what you would typically see you, you write before you did the procedure and the comments you would typically make after the procedure. So there wasn't anything separately we could carve out in order to give credit for both. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you have to make sure. So it's a return patient visit. So you have to hit two out of the three key components for an E and M, right? So history, exam, or plan. Two out of the three plan, of course. So you're talking about different treatment options that we could perhaps pursue after this. There you go with your plan. So you'd have to meet something a little different about history or exam in order to build for the E and M. That, that sounds more like something that you probably could bill an E&M with because you're going to probably document a lot more than you normally would if you hit this patient's established and they're coming in for a scheduled visit. So that sounds sounds more like an example where you could bill an E&M. And, of course, if you're addressing a separate problem. Yes, a separate problem. You know, with that, that's really cut, cut and dry. The problem I see is when it's a scheduled event, you know the patient's coming in, and you're managing their medications based on the diagnostic test results. Um, so it's not, there's nothing there outside of what you would routinely do post the procedure, pre the procedure. But that sounds to me like it could support an E&M, and I'd be happy to look at an example. If you send me the MRN number and date of service, I can leave a card. You bill for eligibility services for patients with research credits. You also bill for current hospital services. You lost this career and many new for unclear budgets. Um, so for patients that are in research studies, uh, if the service is rendered, um, you know, solely for eligibility purposes, it's not billable to insurance companies. Or if the service is, is uh, solely for data collection, 
are not billable to insurers. Uh, and of course, free services wouldn't be billable to insurers. Uh, we have Encore and Epic uh, as tools to help us get the billing right for these patients. In Encore, we build, uh, we build the study calendar. So we need to know all the services that the patient's going to receive, which are standard of care. We know those go out to insurance, which are research only. We know those go to the response. Um, but none of the, and then in Epic, we'll build the calendar for the patients as they're enrolled. But none of that can be, can come close to being possibly right unless you make sure that the contract budget and the economic consent are really clear as to what are just the study-related procedures. If we don't have, we find inconsistencies many times when we look between these documents, um, and they're not really clear about the services, um, where they're supposed to go. So if you could please just keep that in mind when you're doing research studies that if you get that part right, we have a great shot of getting the billing right. Now, last villain is Dr. Vito Corleone. He's a graduate of the Broken Legged Lamb University. Uh, extensive experience in mental health issues, gambling, antisocial personality disorder. And yeah, I think the name tells us. He's from what movie? Heard it way back there. Who said Godfather? Oh, over there. Okay. Obviously, we're going to have to fix our music with these things. So, Dr. Corleone um, accepted kickbacks from American Supply Company. He violated the Stark Law, and he incurred fines under the uh, False Claims Act. So, for the first one. You know, in, in every other industry, it's really acceptable to reward customers that refer services to you or business to you, but in healthcare, it's not. Um, and the fines are pretty steep, as you can see. So the government feels that um, if you accept kickbacks, it could lead to corruption of medical decision making, it could lead uh, to overutilization of the services, it could lead to costs to the program, um, and it can also lead to patients fearing an unfair competition. So for Stark, um, Dr. Corleone was referring patients to his wife's oxygen supply company, right? And you can't do that. So, um, but just know that under an academic medical center setting, there are a lot of exceptions to the Stark Law. So, any questions you have about that are really best directed to the Office of General Counsel. Now, um, the False Claims Act can be provided uh, in code for billing for services not rendered. We had a case recently where. It was somebody billed for the E and M visit with a procedure, and there was no documentation. So the patient Connecticut had to go on that. If you misrepresent your services, so if you're always up coding your E and M, um, or double billing, so there's definitely fines associated with that too. That's also known as the whistleblower law. So if somebody's disgruntled and they go to the feds, and it's a bona fide dispute, they can get up to 30 percent of whatever the government recovers. So it's kind of strong incentive if you have disgruntled folks around. You're right, you're right. Um, so under the False Claims Act, um, the government doesn't have to prove intent, but they have to prove that you know you had information knowing that it was incorrect, kind of deliberate ignorance of the law. I mean, this doesn't happen on your routine. This is a systemic issue, right? So, yeah. All right, so I think we're on to our last villain, which is Dr. Joker, his credentials he went the last factory. You're going to walk away with a lot of stress flaws today. <laughs> okay, so his fatal flaws were he kept his head in the sand regarding compliance concerns. He paid $2 million because of a health care fraud conviction, and he was excluded from Medicare and Medicaid. So, you know, we hope that if you have compliance concerns that you could take the normal routes by bringing your concerns to senior leadership or to the compliance department. But if you can't, we have a hotline <laughs> that is manned, manned by an outside company. Uh, when calls come in, they, they're routed to the director of university audit, and he decides who to investigate the matter. Uh, but then you're in trouble. 
I, I just want to bring up this. This is really something new for compliance. Uh, now on our website, we have a form that you can fill out for questions that you want to ask us. Um, most, they're really for routine inquiries. Um, you know, you can pick up the phone and call us anytime uh, with questions. This is used primarily by our new central billing team, and it's providing us with, with really good data about what types of questions are out there, what departments they're coming from. We can use it to make sure we're timely in our responses, and we can use the information for tracking uh, and training. So just so you know that, that that's out there. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about excluded, too. Uh, if, you are if you have a health care fraud conviction, if you fail to pay back a federal school loan, or if you lost your license due to a drug or alcohol conviction, then you can end up on Medicare's Medicaid excluded list, meaning you cannot uh, bill for any Medicare or Medicaid patient, which uh, would not be very beneficial for us at an academic medical center. So that concludes our presentation on your medical billing compliance for 2018. We'd be happy to take any questions. So we would definitely let you know if we did an audit and we found some things that we wanted to talk to you about. We would certainly send you a letter, uh, meet with you. If we ended up meeting with you, it meets your training requirements. Um, I do have eight audit staff in the department, and so there's currently about 2,400 physicians, practitioners. So you know we can't audit anybody, but we always get phone calls from physicians saying, can you take a look at this note? And they give us their the MRN and the data service. We look at it and provide feedback. Um, our office is recently going over some structural changes because uh, we faced a, 10 mil, a draft $10 million overpayment from Medicaid uh, for six audits recently. And that, of course, got the attention of higher ups. We did get that down to $2.7 million, but that's still a lot of money. Uh, so the Office of General Counsel is helping us restructure compliance so that we can do more proactive audits of your billing. Um, we've been in a reactive mode since EPIC has gone into place because the central billing folks or the folks in your department were so nervous that we went on the EMR and the billing system at the same time, they were really looking at your notes and your billing more so than they ever did. And as a result, we were flooded with, can you look at this? And it turned into audits and whatever. But, but we're refining how we do these types of audits where we have a systemic issue. Uh, we're having a much smaller statistically valid random sample, which is really dropping the number of services and we're allocating much more time to doing proactive audits. So yeah, you, you may be receiving letters from us, but again, we're here to help. You know, billing is not, billing and documentation is not, it's not an easy thing, it takes a village. You know, if you have any questions, we're, hap we're happy to help in that regard. And I, I just wanna interject that the billers and coders are looking at your services on a regular basis, and we do get quite a few inquiries from them. Can you take a look at this before we let the charge go out? And we will contact if there's a problem. Yeah, we don't want you to do that. You need to get paid for what you do. So, um, you're, you know, the central billing office are really the boots on the ground at this point. And if they, they do think that something, uh, you're not billing something correctly, even if it's underbilling or overbilling, they're sending inquiries to us. We've provided the central billing team with a grid of every situation we could possibly think of. And, you know, for most of them, they can contact you directly, right? And for some of them, they need to refer it to us so that, that we can make sure you get the, um, the correct information because it's a little more complicated. And we would definitely give you feedback if you were underbilling as well as overbilling. Uh, n no, I, I don't know that it's random. There's nobody here from the central billing team to address that specifically. Um, they're mostly looking at the bills you're dropping versus the documentation that you have. That doesn't happen in all cases. Depends on the uh, department, depends on the risk associated with particular procedure. It depends. If something about the billing looks kind of odd to them, they're gonna go back and look at your documentation. Or if you bill like a modifier 25, they want to make sure you have enough documentation in there for the E&M. 
one thing I strongly encourage you to do because I get this this complaint quite a bit is that the, the coders have a process that if they, they need your feedback in order to have this bill go out, please, I know you get a lot of stuff in your inbox, but the charges can't go out unless you give them some information to do that with. So they're, they're not trying to harass you, they're trying to get your bill out the door. And they will often forward those types of inquiries where they've reached out to you several times if someone's not responding so we can get the claim out the door correctly. So two, two things I know about. One is we do monitor things like that. You know, Anthem was sending our faculty modifier 25 letters saying, you know, faculty members filling modifier 25 too often. And we would take a look at that. And if you look good, we're not going to do anything about it. And, and uh, um, an initiative I just learned about recently is uh, a clinical initiative optimization that Dr. Kateri has uh, instituted. And that team is looking at your utilization, so within urology. They're, going to, they're looking at, say, your, how you bill E&M levels. And if you look like you're billing level fives more than anybody else in the department, they're asking them to look at it. And generally, um, that will come to us, and we will compare you to uh, academic data, not just here in urology, but urologists that are in academic practices across the country. And if you look okay with that, we're good. Um, you know, and the, the commercial payers of Medicare and Medicaid compare you to docs in the community, urologists in the community, which is not really representative, a good comparison for you, because generally the community docs are referring the patients to you, so you're seeing more complicated pace, cases. I mean, that being said, we still, that's what the government and the commercial payers would audit you by. They don't have the academic data. So we look at a broad spectrum of data, look at your documentation. If you see an issue, we would contact you. Uh, they definitely look at um, E and M utilization. They also uh, have a time assigned to each EPC code, so they're looking at who might have a medically unbelievable day, right? I mean, it, it happens. And again, and again, I don't think their data is um, all that accurate for academic medical centers because we've got residents, uh, and you're working with HROs and PAs. So um, I actually have some compliance risk. Uh, software that I'm using now, and I've, I've identified, or it's identified, some physicians that have medically unbelievable days, so we're going in and looking at that. Yeah, it looks at your E&M, it looks at all kinds of things. Yeah, the hours in the day, it's, it's kind of unbelievable that you could have done all that in one day. Yeah. But I'm happy that we finally have some software that's that's comparing everybody to that, and and whoever is kicking out at the top, you know, we're going to check it out, and if it's everything's fine, then we feel very comfortable we can defend this. Yeah, we never we don't do random audits. No, no, We've no, never no, done no, random no, audits. Right. Absolutely. More of that. And I yep. I know. Right. Yeah, always. Yeah. I wish I wish I had yeah. Right. Oh, definitely. And I wish I had the resources to audit every physician that, that came into the practice. Because I think, you know, if, if somebody, maybe somebody's just not doing something as silly as the review of systems isn't documented correctly when you're billing your higher levels. I mean, it's a simple thing. Uh, I would love to be able to do that, but we don't have the resources. We did offer um, like 13 or 14 sessions uh, maybe June, July, during the summer for new physicians. And unfortunately, it was really not very well attended. So, you know, that either tells me I, I'm not offering it at, at a good time or maybe we need to look at it some other way. Yep. Yep. So 
Oh, we love to do that. We love to take like one of your E&M visits, right? And we'll give you the medical record and we'll audit it in front of your eyes, exactly how an outside auditor would look at it. Yeah, definitely. We'd be happy to help out. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. You know what it is? Let me show you something. You can't really see with the music. Every patient center is lifted to tell the patient centers or centers that are in surgery. Okay. They're relinquishing the responsibility to the patient. They want to stop. Yeah, but. You're not going to, if I walk in my office, you're not just going to say, yeah, I'm going to operate on you. That's why you have to do it on art. Look at my case, make yeah, sure you're going to operate on me. Is so you're, I would think that you're like sending a letter back to whoever sent it to you and saying, I agree, this person needs surgery. Yeah. I mean, you need to think about the No, you see, of like normally when you go down no, here, the stuff will come up, it's not coming up because you've been bedding it. As, as Got it. Trisha, I mean, we're yeah. consultants. Okay. If the line is drawn in the sand, it's in black and white, I need surgery. And my doctor says, if you go to Yale and have surgery. That's why. Right. 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 Right.